this would be a game where you're not really winning. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to very slowly and gradually get a little better. No, no, the win state is that as long as you're not losing, you've won. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris imagine a hypothetical game to recreate the social situations in the show Rectify. Plus, an Overwatch update, impressions of the quiet year, and reckless speculation about the NX. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 78 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hello. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And Jim, how about you introduce our topic for today? Um, Well, today we're going to sort of delve into design, try to design our own game with a concept that generally isn't used for video games, Um, sort of a slow burn character drama based on a television series uh, that I've seen recently called Rectify. Which we'll talk about a bit later. Cool. Uh, before we get to that, though, we have some opening segments, including hashtag get wrecked. It's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. All right, so we've talked about Overwatch before. Um, recently, uh, at the time of recording, the uh, um, season two of competitive mode just came out and they made some interesting changes to the way that that's all going to work. Um, and it's interesting for me having played this game pretty much since its launch. It's the first time I've been following a, you know, large scale, um, multiplayer online sort of arena style game. Um, and it's really interesting for me to watch how the meta has kind of evolved over time. And one of the things I really like the Blizzard's doing in their approach is they're being as transparent as they can be about the decisions they're making. Um, so when they first announced competitive mode, they talked about, you know what things they were doing with it and why. Uh, now in season two, before they launched that, they were talking about the changes they were making and why. So they were saying like, "Hey, so we've been hearing you know feedback from the community, and we've been you know kind of considering these options. And they'll you know when they make a decision about something, they'll explain. So here's the thing we're changing, and here's the reason why we're doing it. And we understand that it might upset some people, but we think it's the best thing for the game overall. Um, so I've been really I've been really liking that. And it's not something that's necessarily new to uh, the sort of game people have written up posts or, you know, somewhere in their patch notes and stuff like that, they'll explain some of their thinking sometimes. Um, but the thing that's kind of neat about this is, one, people, I think, engage more with video now than with um, with text, especially if it's just kind of like gamers who are trying to watch a quick thing before they, you know, go play their games. They're not really interested in reading this sort of stuff. But they uh, they also put it into their their launcher. So whenever you bring up the uh, the Battle.net launcher in order to play any of the Blizzard games that connect to the, connect to the net, um, they have these little marquees of uh, sort of like interesting content and sometimes it's just like fun fan made stuff sometimes it's um, you know an announcement about a tournament coming up and sometimes it's something like this where it's a sort of developer update on here's the decisions we've been making so just very briefly um, kind of the biggest thing I think for season 2 um, that they explained why they're changing is that people didn't like sudden death in season 1 and so they're changing up the format of the matches uh, one to make them a little bit quicker but two to eliminate the sudden death aspect because people it was kind of a coin flip who gets to attack or who gets to defend and very often it felt like it was kind of meaningless. It was just kind of whoever won the flip was the one who won the game, despite having this really cool, close match leading up to it. Um, and so that's just one, that's one of the things that's changed. They explained their thinking behind it. They wanted to remove that, that sort of coin flip thing. Um, and then they explained in pretty good detail what it was they were changing about it. So if you watched the video, you wouldn't have been surprised when you hopped on and season two played quite differently than season one. Um, but judging by the uh, the chats, uh, there are a bunch of people who did not watch the video before hopping on season two, uh, because there's <laughs> every every game I've played so far, there's been someone who's surprised when you know there's one more round than they expected. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to mention that real quick. Uh, I'm appreciating Blizzard's approach to uh, keeping this game up to date. Good old Blizz. This is Roleplay for Roleplay, the mechanics of tabletop roleplaying games. I don't know if I would actually call this a roleplaying game, Chris, would you? Probably not. We're talking about The Quiet Year. Now, 
Um, wow. Why don't, why don't you give the sort of summary, the pitch, the... Because you played it more than once. I played mm-hmm. it once. Gotcha. Um, the Quiet Year is a map drawing game uh, about building up a community. They're basically, the, the premise, and they give you a very intentionally vague sort of setup for the story. Yeah, the, the, the war with the jackals. Yeah, you're, we've been at war with the jackals. The war is over, and now it's time to rebuild. And basically, we have a year before we know the frost shepherds are going to come. Oh, and not the frost shepherds. Chances are we're not going to survive the encounter. But all we're worried about right now is just building up this community. And so, what they ask you to do is each of the players kind of takes on the dual role of representing people in the community and caring about what happens to it, Mm -hmm. but also playing the role of, in a sense, what the GM would typically do, which is to impose challenges and to kind of, they they call it almost like a a scientist kind of inflicting harm upon this community to see what happens. Um, So you have to be both subjective and objective as you're building this, but mm -hmm. the most interesting, I guess, mechanic to me is you physically draw this. Mm -hmm. Now, they describe it in on being like an 11 and a half uh, or eight and a half by 11 sheet Mm -hmm. of paper that you're drawing on, and you just you do it in a little half inch kind of drawings. But we actually. We went we went big scale with this. We, mm-hmm. we got out my my really big whiteboard, like the size of a table whiteboard, mm-hmm. and threw it down. It had uh, colored whiteboard things, and, and we updated it. And we we were not afraid to do some erasing and that kind of thing. How does that compare to the first time you played it and, and the changes that, that came along with that? Well, the first thing is that each time you play the game, people sort of define things about the surroundings of the uh, the community. So each well, person true, yeah. at the very beginning of the game takes a turn drawing something on the map. And so, okay, here's our community, and it's kind of like this. Like maybe we set up in the hole of a you know shored ship or something like that. Right. Uh, we did then, a shopping mall for ours. Yeah. yeah. And then someone else says, okay, well, we've got uh, mountains over here, and then they'll draw the mountains. And someone else says, oh, and there's a coastline over here. And someone else says, oh, and there's uh, trees all around us. And so everyone kind of gets a chance to find something. And then you sort of take it in turns. Each person draws a card. And what they do is they set the... Um, you mean a playing card, like a yeah, regular... Like deck of 52. 52 deck, yeah. Four um, suits and all that. And so you split the four suits up and you sort of you shuffle each suit individually. And then you stack them in a particular order so that you draw through spring first and then you draw through summer and then you draw through fall and then you draw through winter. Um, and I think it's the King of Clubs. That sounds right. Or King of Spades. I forget which one it was exactly. It's the last one. It's yeah. The, whatever the winner is. I think it's Spades. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you draw that one, the Frost Shepherds come. But it could be as early as week one of winter. It could be as late as week 12 of winter. Um, so in winter, you don't really know exactly when the game's going to end. Mm-hmm. And that has an interesting dynamic. Um, but you draw these cards. And the cards will often say... Um, give you a, a vague prompt for uh, somebody starts a project in the community, what is it? And then you sort of draw it on the map to represent it. Right. And so as the game goes on, everyone is sort of adding to the map and uh, you start projects, you're trying to count down the weeks until it's done, and then you'll update something based on that. You discover new things, you have discussions within the community. Um, it's quite interesting as a kind of collaborative world-building exercise. Um, but what did you think of it? Well, you know, that's that's what we went uh, kind of off the rails with it. We followed the rules and did everything we were supposed to do, uh, for the most part. But what we chose to do was to create a world so that as we move forward, using a different system, uh, of really a series of one-shots is what we're planning on doing, um, we're going to do it within that world we've created. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's, in and of itself, kind of an interesting world-building exercise. Mm. The complaint I had about it, or the problem I had with it, was I felt like it take, took too long. Mm. Um, so if I do this again, I, I'm not going to use all the cards. Uh, what I think I'm going to do is maybe cut the deck in half, mm. um, still sort like like we intended to, but then cut you know maybe half of each suit out mm-hmm. um, just to cut down the the time because our group is very descriptive mm-hmm. we're very narrative driven and yeah, so i think we, we spent a lot of time on <laughs> there was card. a lot of exposition and, you know I, I think i kind of failed to answer fully your question that you asked me which is how did it compare to the first time i played oh it. that's true yeah it was with a different group it was in a different setting we tended to go quicker um so it didn't take it didn't feel as long at least and i think there's also something to be said for when we played it this most recent time in order to turn it into a setting for a series of one shots the fact that we went into it knowing that kind of colored, I think, our perception of the game. That makes sense. That we focused a little bit more on the, the world building. And while we did to kind of tell stories, um, the the times I'd played before felt a little bit more self-contained. Mm-hmm. We were playing the quiet year for the sake of the quiet year and not really like looking for the little things we might draw out later, which I don't know how much it affects it, but it did, it did have a different feel because of that. Right. Yeah, I, I would say that that's true. And what I really like about the potential of 
this game. I, I hesitate to even call it a game. It's more like an exercise or something. I think it would be really great for like um, a, a weekend retreat uh, if you're, I don't know, you're going to like theater camp or something. <laughs> I, mean, I think it would be fantastic. A writer's retreat or something. Um, but what, what I really liked about that whole experience was building a world together. And, and that was my favorite part of it. Um, so, you know, if you're not really hung up on the specific characters, that kind of a thing, it might be a great thing to just do on a game night for fun. Uh, it's kind of a one shot build, you know, character building kind of world building kind of get to know each other experience. As long as you sort of treat the community as the character in a sense, then right. what you have is this story of what happens to this community throughout this year. Um, and it's going to be a little bit different every time, even though you're still drawing from the same deck of cards mm-hmm. with the same prompts. Um, That's a good way to put it. I, yeah. I like that. So, very interesting game. Check it out if it sounds interesting to you. If it doesn't, you probably would hate it anyway, so I guess don't check it out. <laughs> That's very true. What's the <laughs> website? The website is uh, buriedwithoutceremony.com, and from there, I'm sure there are uh, links to purchase and download the PDF for, uh, I'm pretty sure there's a physical book, too, that you can order. Um, but I've only ever played it on PDF myself. This is the Gaming Meta, news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. Recently, actually not that recently when this show goes out, uh, but I guess a couple of weeks ago, Mm -hmm. Nintendo uh, had one of their Nintendo Directs that like to give news out in those little shows, and um, the news was really focused mostly on the 3DS. Um, They're actually going to come out with a version of Yoshi's Woolly World for the 3DS, which was originally on the Wii U. Mm-hmm. Um, they're also coming out with a new Pikmin game for the 3DS. Oh, that's interesting. The one I wanted to talk about the most, actually, was Super Mario Maker 3DS, which they're releasing. And the odd thing about that is that they're releasing the game, but it's a, a stripped-down version of the game. Hmm. What um, do you mean? So I wanted to know what y'all think. Yeah, so you can still make courses... But you can only share the courses you make on your 3DS locally. You can't actually share them online. No, oh, you just have to like be face to face with someone, basically. I guess it's the same room. It, yeah, it just says locally, hmm. um, and then it also says maybe it's like with their me, like you have to interact with their me on like Street Pass or something, probably. Oh. And then well, also the Street Pass, I think, would actually make a lot of sense. That's what I think how they're doing it. Yeah. Whereas you, with Wii U, you can get any of them online. Mm-hmm. Plus. You can't actually get the cor- like you can get the courses from Wii U. Most of them, some of them are not. They're not going to let you get for still unclear why. Mm-hmm. But you can't even search for courses like you can with the Wii U. Hmm. It just courses show up in your recommended list huh. based on whatever algorithm they use. And then also you you have courses when you play the the um, the Mario Challenge mode that they have in Wii U. Mm-hmm. So you have some features of the game, but then other features that don't exist. Um, all the, the you have the mystery mushrooms that are, that are used as a lot of times little gimmicks for fun little things mm-hmm. in um, Mario levels. Well, those don't exist at all in the 3ds version. So there's just little weird par- elements of the mm-hmm. game that are stripped out that it's, seem odd, odd choices. It sounds to me. to me like they're trying to have the 3ds version be more casual in the sense that it's more curated. Um, they're giving you a limited selection of courses to play that are recommended by whatever algorithm, like you said, right. um, or they're based on street passes. So it's more like, okay, hey, hey what's the, what, what level am I going to play today? Rather than having you sit down as you might with the Wii U and go and search for something or to like go on the internet and try to find courses that you might try. And I think the difference being is that the 3DS, because it's portable, mm. there's a philosophy with portable game development that is, you're only going to be playing for a few minutes at a time. And so, while I'm sure a lot of people would be willing to take their computer and search for a course that they're interested in and punch in the code and pull mm. it up on their 3DS, I think a lot of people who are going to be getting it on the 3DS, especially if they don't have it on the Wii U, or maybe especially if they do have it on the Wii U and the 3DS is just an alternate version, it's the more curated, I'm going to pop this open, I have five minutes, what level should I play? I'll play that one. I'm going to play this for five minutes, close my 3DS, and go back to my day. So the other interesting part about that, I mean... Good luck. I hope you find a good recommended level. But <laughs> you're not going to be able to look for it. And your your choices in the 100 Mario the Mario challenges are crapshoot at best. Mm-hmm. But um, the other part that I had forgotten to mention was these games, you can actually um, share locally with someone an incomplete level. Oh, So they can help you finish it. Hmm. Oh, that's kind of neat. Kind of collaborative. Which seems interesting, except... Not entirely sure how often that's going to u- be used because the more mm-hmm. I think about it, it's like, are you necessarily going to want 
to build part of a level, and unless you specifically know that person, mm-hmm. that, that's just kind of some random thought. person through Street Pass because that's what Street Pass is. Usually, it's just random people. Yeah, yeah. So it seems it seems like it, it's going to be a very limited feature. And mm-hmm. if you know that that person, and you have a 3ds, you could literally just hand them your 3ds. So it feels odd that they're doing it in this way. I think the idea there is that maybe when you happen to be hanging out, you pass on the level, you guys split ways, and then over the course of the next week, they finish it out because they have their own copy of the game. And then you come back together, and then they like give it back to you and say, "Hey, this is what I did this last week." You know, so I, I can see kind of how it'd be used, but it can also be potentially kind of weird. Mm. So, well, uh, it, considering as, mobile games are exclusively for kids, I can see why they would. Make that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's of course a reference to, to our earlier, podcast, earlier yes. podcast having to do with stigmas in games. <laughs> well, well, mobile very big difference between mobile gaming and handheld gaming. Yes, that's very true. Um, and I wasn't serious anyway. I was <laughs> um, yeah, so j- sort of to build off of this, too, from the Nintendo Direct, I do have some reckless speculation for y'all. Oh, boy. Grab your salt shakers, because it's time for some reckless speculation. Mark's used to engage with rumors, hearsay, and all sorts of crazy theories. It's a little primer here. The Nintendo NX, their newest system, um, is rumored heavily to be um, unveiled later this year and potentially even to come out sometime next year. That is mm. the current rumor. Well, well, that, I would assume they would aim for Christmas next year. That maybe would, maybe they will. Christmas um, 2017, in other words. Potentially. Yeah. But, I mean, I don't know. It's it's still it's still uh, rumor at this point. But uh, what, we, what we hear so far, according to rumor, is that it's going to be both a console and a handheld. It will be able to um, I've heard work that, yeah. it function as a handheld, have its own screen, you can take it with you, but you can also connect it to a television and then run it through the I television. I totally called that, yeah, like years and years mm-hmm. ago in class. I, I, I think told it's students. That I think that was coming. Yeah, I kind of figured that was coming one way or the other, and I also figured it's a very natural evolution from the Wii U. I think so too, because yeah. the Wii yeah. U, you can pick yeah. up the screen, turn off the TV, and still play it. You mm-hmm. can even move around a little bit in your house. But first of all, to be able to be to- truly free within your own house. Uh, would be nice with the Wii U, and then just be able to pick it up, take it with you, plug it back in, have the TV if you want the TV. Mm-hmm. It's something yeah. that technically you can do with like the PlayStation Portable and the PS Vita. Like There are cables you can use to plug into the TV, mm-hmm. but it's different in a certain way. Well, part of the difference is those systems are you know a lot weaker than the home, the home console systems. Yeah. This is meant to be... Kind this is a new home, home console, console that mm-hmm. you can take with you. Yeah. I wonder if there'll be a dongle, kind of like the Chromecast or... You know, the fire. That makes sense. Um, I could also see potentially in the same way that you currently have, like, the little dock that you plug the... You just pop the Wii U onto it and it charges up the the gamepad. Um, You just pop that on there, and then that feeds into the TV, and then you have a controller that you can use. So you think there'll be a standalone controller that you can... I would imagine there probably is, just as an option for people. Um, I guess you'd have to actually come to think of it, because if they're going to have games that are going to include local multiplayer... Mm-hmm. which has kind of been a staple for Nintendo games for a long time. Yeah. Um, they probably don't want to get rid of that, because mm-hmm. that's one of the things that I think it, draws people in. It would, it like would be Mario that Kart or, or Smash Bros. It would be people. that or requiring everyone to have their own NX, which I don't think they're going to do. That's never really been their MO. Mm-hmm. Um, like, they'll require people to all have a, a 3DS and a copy of the game, for instance, but that's different than having a home console and expecting everyone to have like bring their home console with them. Right. So. Well, and... and so the other thing is that they, they have confirmed that they are going to be using cartridges, which I think makes sense given if it's going to be portable, you don't mm-hmm. want to have like seat like Blu-ray yeah. or anything like that because mm-hmm. those could break too easily. Well, that's a smart decision, I th- yeah. think, especially since cartridges can hold a lot more you know, information mm-hmm. than they used to be able to. So. Correct, correct. And they're very durable. Yeah. Um, so from they the also read is, pretty quick. So. Yeah. Right. That's the other thing. They read instantly, mm-hmm. whereas you have that, the read time with uh, yeah, CDs. Basically and, solid-state drives is what you got. Mm-hmm. So. So, my regular speculation question here, or what we can do about it, is um, how successful do you think this is going to be? Because the Wii U didn't really go over very well. And I actually liked several of the games on the Wii U. I don't think it's a bad system at all, but it has very limited options. Yeah. I I think it's going to be, in a lot of ways... It's going to be the continuing story of Nintendo having good enough graphics, but not the same as everyone else. And unfortunately, that's still a big deal to a lot of gamers that they want to have the same graphics as everything else. Well, but I do think. Let me ask you this, though. Is it? Because the 3DS crushed the Vita, Mm -hmm. and the Vita is much more powerful. 
Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm not, and that's exactly my point. Is that the graphics? It, it's different on home consoles, but I think that what this might do is kind of be kind of the Wii U taken one step further. And in that sense, I think the concept might be good enough that even if it's not as powerful, I think that it might have a certain appeal. Um, I think that it kind of... We, we've come to this point now where we have like Xbox One and PS4 being very powerful home consoles, but mm-hmm. not nearly as powerful as PCs, and you can tell. Uh, and some people do like the sort of just magical plug-it-in and play box. Um, but because those are still limited to just being at home, if you also have the gaming PC, there's kind of that question of, do I just want to hop on my PC or do I want to play my console? Um, and of course, there's also a cost factor that plays into that too. But right. if, if basically you concede that, yes, my console is not going to be strong graphically, but I can take it with me, then I think that I may be kind of a selling point that Nintendo can... can I can see that. I, I, I think that... I think that the portability is going to be an important thing now that's going to, you know, there's been, there's been this conversation, like, is mobile just going to completely replace, say, the 3DS or even hand, or even home consoles? Are we just going to have, like, one device that does everything? Um, and I think that this is kind of that medium in between, because I don't think that we're going to get to a point now where mobile is, like, the go-to portable thing for serious gaming. Well, it's like when they said for a while that that we weren't going to have consoles because it was just going to all be PC. Mm-hmm. And they kept saying, well, console gaming is going to die because mm-hmm. of the PC game. And it hasn't, yeah. And it hasn't, had, it, but it hasn't it, happened. I think it does have to adapt, though. And I think that this is a step in that direction of it can be probably a home theater system. And that's one of the bigger arguments also for like PS4, Xbox One, is that they can be your home entertainment as well. Um, but now that you can bring it with you, that's just like one more thing it can do that your, say, PC can't. So my cynical question, to answer your question with a question, is where are you supposed to take this thing? I mean, if, if the whole point is, look, now I can take it with me, where is it you're taking it? Well, it's a handheld system, so you can take it anywhere. So you, people take it, like, you know, they get on the bus, they have, a, they have a commute or something, and they're on the bus for, you know, an hour. Mm-hmm. They can play their system. Oh, say okay. they're on a flight, they get on a plane, they're on a flight. They, they, so, in other words, they're taking it all the places they would take their mobile device. No, it's, it's not that they're the, taking or it. Or their 3DS. Right. But it's it's not it's not that they're taking it somewhere to go plug it in. Mm-hmm. To oh, no, no, no. Yeah. No, it has its own screen. It's, yeah. it's, like, it's like a okay. mixture between um, the Wii U. You know how it has that tablet with its own screen? You mm-hmm. can play. It's like a mixture of that concept with a 3DS. Now, now it's truly portable. It's not limited to just 30 feet within your Wii U. And I'm so, assuming, see, what I want is, my, what I want is my PS5 and my phone to just be the same thing. That doesn't make any sense. Why not? Because you need buttons. Well, and, That's and there a would be a, well, there'd buttons. be an, there'd be an external controller that that would be Bluetooth to that device. And and that device is also Bluetooth to my well, television. Why do you want it to do everything? Why not just have a phone and then have a game system? Like I don't get it. Well, because I'd have to buy two things. I just want to buy one. Well, you're gonna get what you pay for if you do that. Oh, interesting. <laughs> there, there are there are ways that like. You can remember the engage. You had that with the engage, Doc. Why didn't you buy the engage? You could have had it. You didn't support it. The, the, Maybe the, I did. The engage is dead because of you. The, no, the, the game, game taco. Was, the engage. game taco. The engage was too ahead of its time. It just it was too ahead of its time. That's what it was. That's what it was. dead before uh, its time. I, I I've been threatening for a while to just try to find an engage and just buy it just to ha- just to have it just to be like I have an engage. You know. I mean, yeah. just to just to give an example of like the whole idea of the Wii U is mm-hmm. I've taken my Wii U with me a couple times on road trips just sitting in the back of the van and, um, you know, plugging in the console and we don't necessarily need a TV to plug it into because I have the Wii, you know, the Wii U remote. Sure. The gamepad. Um, It would be nice to be able to do that without having to, like, physically plug in a full console, you know, like the AC adapter right, and all right, that sort right, of stuff. Yeah. And then like, you know, have it like sitting there very hot on like the, the leather next to me while I'm trying to play it on the, this little screen. If it was just one like compact thing, I make, you know, taking it on a road trip much easier, but then still being able to plug it into a TV when I got back. Easily my my would concern be would be processing power and graphics power. I mean, is it, is it going to be able to do all the things that the Wii's up to this point have been able to do sure. graphically? And, and well, at, at this point we've gotten so far with, with technology, like I mean, the 3D. I, I know you don't have a 3DS, but mm-hmm. you've played some games in the 3DS, have, yeah. and some of them can get can be pretty impressive and look pretty good. The the PlayStation Vita has mm-hmm. even better graphics. Yeah, but, but they're I not on a, a 52 inch screen. And what we're talking about is, is plugging something into a 52 inch. Well, screen. I think that the benefit well, this thing's going to have you, is you can plug in you can plug your you know N64 or something into a 52 inch screen, and it's going to not look that good because of right the graphics. Well, of that's that my point. Period. Is are we going to be but able to do HD graphics? 
oh, are you saying can it do HD? Oh, I'm sure it will. Yeah, I, for I sure, imagine, because we're at that point where everything's yeah. HD at this point. I imagine the form factor is probably going to be closer if they do go this route. This is all right speculation. I imagine it's going to be closer to the Wii U gamepad than it is to, say, the Vita or to your phone. Mm -hmm. We can make our phones even pretty powerful, but sure. it's still not that powerful. But the phones also have to be certain, you know, size, certain thinness. Yeah. This thing's not going to be as limited by that. And so you can actually, like, you know, laptops can be very powerful. And you see how small those are, relatively speaking. That's true. You just pack all the stuff into this little device. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be more powerful than the Wii U also. Yeah, for probably. sure. And so if you, the Wii U itself is already a pretty powerful console. When you, relatively speaking, it's not as powerful as the PS4, but relatively speaking, some of the, gra the games that you can get on the Wii U I think are absolutely beautiful. So just because you can't, I mean, even on the Wii, for example, Super Mario Galaxy, I still think looks like a beautiful game. Or you go back and play even like Metroid Prime on the GameCube, I still think it's a very good looking game. But, um, you know, really to just sort of answer your question, can we do HD with portable? Yeah, I don't see why not. Well, my no reckless, not my reckless speculation is going to be that people are going to hook it up and they're going to be like, all right, this is so awesome. And wait, why does that look? Oh, it's in 720. Oh, I didn't really think. No, 780 is enough a standard there's now. A, there's, a, there's a lag. 720 oh, is HD also. I know, I know it's HD, but that's my point, is that they're going to market it as HD, but it's not going to be, you know, full 1080 or whatever. And it's just like... Uh, there's going to be something, some element of the peripherals a little too laggy, or some, and, and it's just not going to quite be there. That's my reckless speculation. Honestly, if I, I think that they won't release it in that state because they already had a system um, drastically underperform in the Wii U, they're not going to release it in that state if it's like, oh, this, this system's laggy. I mean, that's a pretty major problem, by the way. I know it is. So if that's something that they think is an issue, they'll just hold off the release. Same thing with the graphical issue. I think they're going to be. The whole, one of the whole points of this and one of the big marketing pushes is likely going to be it's going to look great on your big screen and you can take it with you and there'll be a smaller screen so that you can take it with you. So I think that's going to be the big push as opposed to, oh, it's a handheld system that you can plug into your TV. Mm -hmm. Like Chris was saying, that's something that you can do with like the Vita, but it has those problems that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Whereas the whole point of this is that, no, 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 it is a home system, but you take it with you as opposed to it's a handheld system that you can plug into your TV. Oh, I get it. I just That's think the they're going to. I think they're going to cut some corners somewhere, and there will be some fallout for it. Most, whatever, most likely, whatever it is. any cut corners are just going to be that it just won't it, be as, as powerful. As, yeah, it like, won't be as powerful. Right. But I mean, I think 1080 though. That's pretty yeah, much. Yeah, I'm standard. sure. I, I'm, I'm expecting HD. What's going to yeah. happen though is that it won't. It'll. It'll be probably. It'll be possibly as powerful as like the PS4 is now. Maybe. Mm -hmm. That's even like a maybe. But let's say that it is as powerful or slightly more powerful than the PS4. Before too long, you know, they'll come out with like a new system of it, like within like a few years, mm -hmm. and there'll be like a PS5 and it'll be a lot more powerful. But they're already talking it, about like a new version of right. the Xbox One, the PS4, that are going to be more powerful. So, but in the but those things are not going to be like until they new console, right? Yeah. And until they come out with a new console, that won't matter because how many game companies are really going to go, yes, I'm going to make this only for this one version of mm -hmm. this console as opposed to make it for a version that. Everyone can play. We're already kind of seeing that, actually, with the new 3DS. There yeah. are some games that are only for the new 3DS. Yeah. Um, it'd be interesting to take a look at how those perform versus games that can be on either. I think the only ones that are for... Aren't the only ones that are are just for the, for the new 3DS um, on, like, the Wii Shop, the eShop? That I'm not sure. I'm pretty um, sure because, for example, like Majora's Mask was recommended for the new, but it works perfectly fine yeah. on the original. I know one for sure that's only on the new 3DS is um, Xenoblade Chronicles when they ported that to 3DS. Okay, that makes sense though because, um, like you said, they ported it over, mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't think the original one could quite handle it. Yeah. I think it's the reason. Yeah, but there's also that. But yeah, yeah, I see. It was original Wii. Yeah. Anyway, we're we're getting way off tack <laughs> here, but reckless speculation. That's pretty reckless, guys. Yeah. That's pretty reckless. <laughs> Uh, my my wreck of speculation. I don't know. I mean, I, I hope that it does well. I, I like the concept, so I, I certainly don't think the problem is going to be. Um, it's not HD. I think the I think people will might complain that it's not powerful enough for the people that always do. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I but think, Nintendo's been doing that now for ten plus years. So I mean, yeah. <laughs> they need this to be a hit. I'll say that because mm -hmm. they, they've made well, they've made good money with the 3DS. It's been successful, but the Wii U has not been. It is it is not made. Anywhere near what they what their projections stated, and so they're certainly not going to rush this out to release. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. Let's 
let me give you all a little bit of background here before we jump right in. Um, because my thumb is still broken, I've uh, not been playing too many video games. I have been watching um, more films and uh, television. So I found this show on Netflix. Um, this was originally a Sundance Channel original, um, which is a channel I don't think I've ever actually watched before. <laughs> uh, but it's called Rectify. And it's a very uh, slow burn character. It's a slow burn character drama. Um, there's no real action. It's just all about um, the characters and um, their experiences, and it's but it's a very interesting show, and it's 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 very engrossing. And the concept is simply this: um, this this uh, this guy's name is name is Daniel, and he um, when he was 18 years old was arrested and and tried and convicted for rape and murder of um, essentially I think essentially his girlfriend kind of that's been sort of like not necessarily true is like some of the stories going on, mm. but essentially, um, for the rape and murder of, um, you know, his girlfriend, he lives in this small town. And so it was a massive media circus when this happened. And, um, he was put on death row. He was convicted. It's in, it's in, I believe, uh, Georgia in mm. a small town in Georgia. So he's put on death row. And, um, this whole time, you know, he, he essentially also confessed to the crime. I should add that into it. Um, he had just barely turned 18. So he didn't have any representation with him. Didn't have his parents with him. He had no lawyer. And they basically kind of bullied him into a confession. Well, their whole case rested on DNA evidence. Mm. Um, so comes come to find out, twenty years later, um, they're able to get this you know DNA, DNA evidence thrown out because it's not his DNA. Mm. And um, there's a lot of questions about how did this happen? You know, was he set up? That kind of thing. Um, but the point is, they can't hold him anymore. That's what the entire case hinged on. So they had to release him. This is 20 years later, though. So he spent um, pretty much, he kind of grew up in a sense, because he was still in high school. He was still kind of a kid. He just had barely turned 18. And he spent 20 years in on wow. death row. So over half his life, he was institutionalized. Right. And, mm -hmm. Okay. So now he's out. And um, they, they do a lot of these flashbacks as well to kind of show how his character changed and developed in death row. So mm -hmm. you actually get to know him on death row and the people that he, that he talked to. Because it's a different situation. It's very isolationist, but you still have people you can talk to as opposed to a normal prison where you're, you have a roommate and you're, it's a little more social. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, kind of a different situation. But um, the interesting part about the show is it's really about his, how he interacts with his family. Of course, how his family has changed over the years. Mm -hmm. And the people in his town, town have changed and how people react to him. So many of them still believing that he actually did it. And so many of them sort of treating him like he's a, you know, a rapist and a killer. That's yeah. like walking around. Yeah. You, you just got lucky, you know, you're, that you're out, you should still be in there. That sort of attitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because technically what they said was, okay, well, Oak, oh, it's not your, it's not his DNA, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean he didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Technically. It just means that legally we can't get hold, hold him. Right. And yeah. one of the, mm -hmm. one of the things about that show that I, I really like, and I'm pretty far into season two now, it's only three seasons. Um, you still don't know if he did it or not. I mm -hmm. mean, it's very much a, He's not come out and said, I didn't do it, ever. He says he doesn't remember. That was always his story. Mm -hmm. He didn't remember. He doesn't seem like the kind of person that would do it, but there's, like, hints of things that go along along with it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of... It's left up to the viewer to sort of interpret. Mm -hmm. But now bringing this into video games, and, and before... Bringing this into video games, my question kind of is, how could you take this sort of concept of, you know, a character drama... Where, as opposed to having these, because um, video games tend to be very heavy on, or many of video games tend to be very heavy on um, um, verb game, I believe is one of the terms that you used before, Doc, mm -hmm. like a yeah. verb game versus an adjective game or something. Um, this would not really fall into a verb game category because this is very much a character-based, um, interaction-based game. Okay. Um, no, it'd still be verbs. Or concepts. Di different, different types of Possibly verbs. so, and that's yeah. kind of my question. It's like, mm -hmm. how would you, if you, if you were tasked with not translating this property, but translating the concept, mm -hmm. um, I think some of the things that would be important to keep in mind would be um, making the player feel that sort of, you know, isolationist, mm -hmm. that sort of everyone's kind of keeping him away. Either either they, they, they don't want to get anywhere near this person, you, the player, mm -hmm. or um, they treat you as some sort of, like, weird, whacked-out celebrity. Like, you just... you. Because it's a small town, everyone knows you. There's no escaping it. Yeah, um, you have this sort of sense of notoriety about you that you can't can't get around. Everyone's expecting you to act a certain way, mm -hmm. 
but they haven't known you for like for 20 years, so your life is very different, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Is this something that could be translated to a game? Do I you, think so. Or should it be translated? Should this concept, should a character drama like this be translated to a game? And if so, what would it look like? I think I would start by looking at some of the Telltale yeah. um, you know, adventure mm-hmm. story games. Uh, but then I'd also branch out into looking at stuff like Oxenfree and some of the more indie narrative heavy type games that are really are about relationships. Mm-hmm. And I think that... Because that's what this is definitely about, relationships. I mean, right. all, the whole thing is about the way that he interacts with well, people. character or, drama usually is, yeah. so that doesn't surprise me a bit. I think another thing to be important is to kind of... I think, I imagine a lot of the drama from what you've described comes from, for instance, like trying to get a job and being limited in that because only so many people will give you a chance, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. The reason you need a job is to basically make a living, and you need to make that living so that you can pay your bills, you can have food, you know, on and on. And so I would almost introduce kind of like a... I'll, I wouldn't go too heavy with it, but I'd have something of a life simulation sort of thing going on where you have to go through, you know, day by day or week by week or whatever, and you have to pay the bills and you have to go to work and all this sort of stuff. Like, I'm almost picturing the, the daytime stuff. Well, yeah, I, say, I say daytime, but the, the real world elements of, say, like Persona where you go through and you have to decide what you're spending your time on, who you're speaking with, but with the difference that now instead of everyone generally being friendly toward you, you have a lot more people who are hostile toward you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the interesting thing here, I'm um, so far he hasn't he hasn't even gotten a job, and one of the issues he's been living with his mother, mm. and of course one of the problems there is that he doesn't really have experience with anything. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have any real job training or anything, any sort of like skills necessarily, um, because he was on death row during the period that most people would either you know start to practice a trade or go to college. Yeah. Yeah. So he doesn't really have, I mean, he could try to get a job at like a convenience store or something, but it's a small town. Those jobs are generally taken. Mm -hmm. Um, and plus people know him, like you said, you have that, that challenge of, because I think one of the, one of the things that would be interesting to do, not just the character drama element, but the, the element of you as the player or, or a, are a social pariah. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of an interesting element, I think in, in games where generally we play heroes or we play like an exaggerated cartoony villain. Mm-hmm. Like we don't really play the, like you are, you are a social pariah. Everyone kind of, they're disgusted by you, but you're not like, you're not kill on sight. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like yeah. games where they see you and you're like, you're, you're evil. So they're all going to try to kill you. It's not like that. It's just, no one really wants to have anything to do with you. That's a think, really good point. I yeah. think something that would help to kind of create the feeling of frustration would be to have all these different actions you can take, um, you know, gestures, I say more so than actions, but mm. you can like do things for people or you can say things to people and you're going through the conversation tree and maybe even you do a thing where as the player you like reload a conversation to see if it changes. This is one of those times where actually the telltale model of not branching as much as people might like actually comes in handy because no matter what you say to someone, it's not really going to change their opinion of you. you you can do everything by the book, but because they're kind of prejudiced against you based on whatever rumors there are or whatever, hmm. they're not going to be swayed by what you say. And if you do that to someone enough, they're going to start to become frustrated. And you can kind of create that feeling in the player. Now there's that question of to what degree do we want the player to feel frustrated? And that that's kind of, I, would, I think that would make it a niche game. Um, I think that would find it really hmm. interesting personally. So, so you're, so you're saying that one of the, one of the traits of this game would be that, you would have all these character interactions, but instead of most games where you're giving these di- you're given these dialogue options because it's going to give you choice in what, mm-hmm. what happens and how people react to you, yeah. instead it's doing the opposite. It's mm-hmm. just it's giving you options of ways that you can react, and maybe what they say might differ based on you know context. Mm-hmm. But it's not actually going to have any mechanical yeah. benefits. And I would maybe say that maybe it's like a long-term sort of strategy thing where, like, you know, a year into it, if you're consistent, then maybe people start to believe you a little bit or something like that. Mm-hmm. Where it's still important that you, like, don't just be like, you know, mm-hmm. screw it, I'm just going to be a jerk to everyone because it doesn't matter. That's going to come back to bite you later or something what, like that. What was that? I just was just reminded of um, something from this old, really old Family Guy joke where Cleveland's family, Cleveland's family there getting together with um peter to play was it like black monopoly i think it was called just called like black monopoly i don't think i've seen this one yeah and the whole joke was you know they couldn't win and peter got frustrated that they couldn't win the game and then cleveland said oh yeah you don't win the game you just do a little better each time oh oh i think i did see that, that was the yeah. joke right oh, okay. God. so yeah so this is sort of like that that mm-hmm. you basically this this would be a game where you're not really winning mm-hmm. you're just trying to very slowly and gradually 
get a little better. No, no, the win state is that as long as you're not losing, you've won. <laughs> that's probably true. That's probably what it would be, to be honest with you. It would be something like that, where as long as you um, don't get killed, mm-hmm. and because, I mean, at this point, there's still people that hate him enough that would try to do something like that. Yeah. So you kind of have to just give them a reason. Yeah, sort of. yeah. You kind of have to keep a low profile. Um, and as long as you don't, you know, die of like starvation or something. Well, it, it really does beg the question though. What, what is the victory condition? How do mm-hmm. you, how do you win this game? I mean, is there a victory condition? I would think that the victory condition, it would be something of an art piece, I think, in that Clearly. it would be... That's what it sounds like to me. It doesn't really sound, you're, you're trying to sound create, like anything else. And it's probably a statement on kind of like, for someone who is in the situation, the victory is merely making it through your life. Like, I have a job, how terrible it might be, I have a home, I have like you know, a roof over my head, I have food, I might have a few friends, maybe, if I'm lucky, but like, you know, I'm I'm gonna live with this forever and so I have to kind of like sm- find the small victories and mm. things. Now, and that's why I think that having that sort of life simulationist aspect would be good because then there's a lot of ways to lose the game and that you can be sent back to jail for whatever reason. Right, you can right. um be evicted. You can like starve to death. I mean, I don't know, but like there's all these things that could happen to you that basically ruin your life. And so getting to a certain point without your life having been ruined in that way would so, be the victory. So to me, this this sounds is sounding more and more like um, more of a simulation mm-hmm. and a user experience than a game. Which is not a yeah, bad thing, but that's what it's sounding like. It's an indie thing, clearly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's kind of an art piece, mm-hmm. I think you said. Yeah. So I think it would be very hard to... Unless you had a very solid story you were trying to tell mm-hmm. and you were going to do it in five episodes and then put it to bed... Uh, and it would be very difficult to just kind of make this into an open world sandbox game. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know how that would work necessarily. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I think one of the interesting elements would be because it, it kind of depends on what you want to do. Because maybe you do just want to tell out, tell a complete story, you know, where eventually, you know, he has to you know, prove his innocence because, of course, people are trying to put you back behind bars. Mm-hmm. They're, and still, for the sake they're of, still looking at the evidence. They're yeah. like, we still can. can put you back in if we have enough evidence kind of mm-hmm. thing. So they're still looking at it. You're just temporarily out. Mm-hmm. So there's that too. I mean, there's, but, but it could also be, maybe this is just, um, a way for you to experience what it would be like to be that social pariah, mm-hmm. which is yeah. something that we don't really experience in, in the game mm-hmm. space. Not really. It can be a very powerful way of getting that across. You know, I think that there are a lot of games that can, you know, sort of empathy games as an idea can give you a sense of what it's like to be someone or to have a certain condition or whatever the case might be that you wouldn't get just by even necessarily talking to them. You kind mm-hmm. of have to experience it. Um, there's actually an interesting example. Um, we've talked, I think, before about 14 Days, yes. where it's that role-playing game about migraines. Um, where being this person for two weeks, even mm-hmm. if you're not literally experiencing the migraine, you at least understand kind of what they're going through. Um, That's the, a really great example. The way that it impacts yeah. you. Yeah. Um, and speaking of migraines, I think it was Excedrin, um, actually did a thing where they set up this little VR rig um, that they would put on someone who wanted to experience because like they, they have a loved one or a friend or somebody who has migraines. And so in order to help them understand what it's like to have the migraines better, they put this thing on the person who doesn't have the migraines. Um, and it like, will like they'll, we'll see their surroundings, but then like it will add brightness or flashes or like kind of the aura effect that people describe with migraines. Um, and it'll like disorient them, they'll have a hard time getting around, seeing where they're going, that sort of stuff. And at so, one point, one of the handlers walks up and punches them in the stomach, like, <laughs> nauseous. Maybe, I don't know. But you know, and it's, they don't do it for very long, but it's just enough. Like they'll come out and sometimes they're like crying. It's like, you know, I tried to be understanding, but like I never really got it until just now. Um, and so that the games have a powerful ability or simulated experiences have a very powerful ability to really let you experience what it is that someone else might be going through. So I think you hit on something kind of cool. I, you know, while I'm not sure this would be a video game that um, would necessarily interest me as a pitch or a concept for a tabletop RPG, man, I'd be all over it. Mm. Oh yeah. So that's interesting. I think that makes, it makes a lot more sense as a tabletop RPG. Now that you mention it is the idea being that you could get multiple players. One person is that, Mm -hmm. is that social pariah kind of, and everyone else is, are the other people in that town or in that situation. That could be very interesting. It's a neat idea for a game character. So then the question I, I have out of that is why is one, a really great idea for a character and the other a really like awkward or difficult idea for a character. What is it about video games that would make that 
oh well okay clearly that's an indie game or clearly that's i I think i think it's just that i think it's the expectation of the audience um games video games that do that sort of thing have kind of been branded as kind of just like the the niche indie Mm -hmm. sort of thing um and not something that would be mainstream appeal whereas rpgs tend to be a little bit more open in that sense i I think i think but then again that's part of why i'm sorry go go ahead chris Uh, well then again like you know doc you and i play a lot of indie rpgs a lot of story driven rpgs yeah we do that's not to say that the majority of people who play tabletop RPGs would be into it, because I think most of those people are into your D and Ds and your Pathfinders. Uh, exactly, that's exactly. exactly. Right. But but I think I think because you mentioned openness, mm-hmm. and I think actually why I I think it would work better as a uh, you know tabletop game is is that openness of it. Of, mm-hmm. Because I think the biggest challenge isn't even, okay, well, there isn't an end state. This would end up being like a very niche experience mm-hmm. when it comes to a video game. Well, I mean, yeah, that's true. But I think the challenging part would be you are you have to go through and, and do all this you know work to mm-hmm. code all these different interactions and, mm-hmm. and design this space and, and build it in like a 3D world mm-hmm. or what have you. Whereas I don't think any of that is, ne- is necessary for this experience. And I think it would be even more powerful mm-hmm. if instead of having AI talk to you, it was other people. Yeah. And, t- you know, if you want to really experience what it's like to be in this situation, it's like this big situation that I've never been in, mm-hmm. but I, I, I'm fascinated by the people that have gone through this. Mm-hmm. Um, Doc, you mentioned before when I was pitching this idea that it sounded similar to some of the um, things that you've seen, like documentaries of people that have gone through similar experiences, mm-hmm. um, which this is not based on any one event, but it is, of course, drawing inspiration from people that have um, been released from prison because they were wrongfully convicted for a long time, or mm-hmm. even released from death row because they were wrongfully convicted. So this sort of thing happens. It's not this is not fantasy. It does happen. Right, right. And so if you were in a space where you had, you know, say, you know, I'm the social prior per- or whatever we're going to call this character. Mm-hmm. And there's like, you know, four five, six other people that are playing mm-hmm. and they're all essentially treating me as such. Mm-hmm. That's going to be a lot more powerful because it's going to be, I'm going to feel at least a fraction mm-hmm. of some of those emotions right, that, right you would actually feel if you're in that situation. Mm. It's 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 something that is, I think, taken for granted, that when you're playing a tabletop role-playing game, you actually really do get into character, even if you're kind of distancing yourself just enough. Like, I know I'm not this character. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting to me, when I've been going through and editing Season 3 of Roll With It, um, how I'll be listening to it, and I'll have certain reactions as me, Chris, listening to the story, um, especially a year after we actually played the thing for the first time. <laughs> um, and then realizing that, like, hey, like, all of us, when we're in character, we're reacting a totally different way. Um, like, I'll, I'll find myself then saying things that surprise me now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I- like, oh, wow, that's not... That wasn't my first thought. And yet, because I was in character and I was a soldier in World War II, uh, I mean, it's, it's close as I can get to imagining what that's like. But I mean, you know, just the situation in the game kind of starts getting you thinking a different way. Mm-hmm. And um, that, that's something that I think could carry over to what you're saying, Jim, where everyone around the table is kind of like, okay, my character sees you a particular way. We're all going right. to treat you that way. And now you've, you're feeling that sort of and, being an outcast. And, and one of the people, because I mean, they're... they're could be like you know the mother of the girl that you were you, you, you murdered, but not mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. But like that still thinks that you did it because she spent her whole life. It makes sense too, hating you basically. Right? She yeah. spent her whole life thinking, okay, well, she put all of her hate and, and emotions for her daughter dying on this person that was convicted and put on death row of mm-hmm. doing it. And so now, after twenty years of doing that, there's no way that you're going to be able to shift your mm-hmm. focus and go, "Where's the justice? Whoops, yeah. I was wrong. This of hating this person. It was someone else. But who is that someone else? I don't even know. You're not going to go through right, that. Sure, yeah. So and no, you, you hate can, this person. And so it, it's like a there's kind of the question of what the objective of the game would be. And, you know, we sort of talked earlier about, you know, not necessarily talking about the tabletop game, but mm-hmm. talking about the video game. Um, the win condition is just simply not losing. It's right. staying alive and still having to deal with all this. Or you can make a victory condition, something more like, you know, proving your innocence. And then right. it kind of becomes like this sort of man on the street, you know, trying to problem solve, solve this mystery sort of thing. So um, you, that, you took me to film noir right there. But you be, just took me to yeah. pretty noir. But that becomes a very different type of game. And so you, is, have to, yeah. you have to ask that question of like exactly what it is and that experience we're trying to recreate. Well, if I was going to tell the story, I would, I would get very specific about it and mm-hmm. I would actually turn it into sling blade, the video game. If you remember that one, mm-hmm. uh, good old, what was his name? Billy, Billy Bob, Thornton. Billy Bob Thornton. Yeah. His, his <laughs> primo performance. It's an old enough movie. I'll go ahead and 
spoil it. <laughs> Basically, this guy, he's you know, he's got some problems. Clearly, uh, he he has uh, some kind of mental disorder or mm-hmm. whatever it is. But um, you know, he's he's basically let out for er, early for good behavior. But he, we think, killed this guy, and it turned out that it was self defense and all these other things. And then he befriends a little boy and the mother, and and she's married to this real jerk and all this other stuff. And as it progresses, uh, you know, you're really endeared to this guy. And basically, he goes in the back. He he sharpens up a sling blade, and then he kills the guy uh, for beating his wife. Mm. And you're kind of like, yeah, he totally deserved that. Oh, but wait, no, that's still murder. Oh, I get it. And, and what, what's happened is, <laughs> is you've gotten into this awkward situation where, you know, is there is there a, you know, shade of gray morality here? Or is it black and white? Is that was that murder justified within that context? Because it really wasn't self defense. It was premeditated, but you know, that was the only way that this woman and her son were going to be freed. And he clearly loved them, and it was an act of love. You know, it's just mm. all these just com- complex kind of things. If you can bring that out in the video game, um, I think that it's totally worth doing. And, and I think you could probably do that very, very well with lots of different layers mm-hmm. and then having the choice at the end, kill him, not kill him, all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. In in kind of a Telltale 5 act model, mm-hmm. I think it would be very easy to tell that story. Now, that actually reminds me of a question that I meant to ask earlier and forgot, is that, you know, you mentioned in the show the the audience doesn't really know whether or not he did or didn't actually commit this murder. Yeah, and I'm also trying not to spoil the series mm-hmm. for y'all if you want to see it or mm-hmm. for any, any I, of the I've same. actually sat here and queued it up on Netflix just, just from you talking about it so the first three episodes or three uh seasons are on netflix right right. um but there's the question of in the game do we tell the player whether or not like hey yes you did do this and you're basically lucky or do we make it very clear to them that no you didn't do this and everything that's happening around you is not justified or do we leave it ambiguous it it should be ambiguous because to the main character in this particular show it is ambiguous he doesn't actually know if he did it or not Mm -hmm. he doesn't remember he doesn't think he did it but he doesn't remember that situation. So in his, from his perspective, he's not quite sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At the risk of making it corny, um, I'm reminded of the walking dead mm-hmm. video game. The first mm-hmm. one, the first yeah. season yeah. at the beginning, like the, you know, you're, you're being taken off to prison mm-hmm. and whenever everything breaks out and then you, you get out of the cop car and you're still in your, like your handcuffs and stuff. I mean, it's really kind of creepy, but then people will ask you, you know, did, did you did? I think it's actually the conversation with the cop in the car. Mm-hmm. He's like, so did you, did you do it? And you have these options mm. and you can actually choose like, yeah, he totally deserved it or it was self-defense. You know, and, and it's like, I'm saying these things, but is it true? Am I lying right now? I don't even know. Well, I think they, at some point in the series, if not immediately, they very clearly established that, yes, you did kill this person. Um, but the circumstances were also like, it wasn't like a cold blooded, like a uh, premeditated murder. It was an act of passion. It's entirely like, possible. Kind of that was, you that something. was your, yeah, gameplay experience. I'm not, yeah, I'm not so sure that they, that they did actually, I think that was, you were able to make those choices and then it came across. You may have way. canonized that in your game. Yeah. I'm not experience. sure. Though. And that's what I'm talking I, about. I can't say that for sure. And maybe, maybe, sure. maybe, well, that was the way that you explain it to someone does change, but I'm pretty sure that they did establish that, yes, you killed this person and here's who it was. And here was, well, you were certainly convicted of killing him and that's right. not the same thing, but, um, uh, you know, and, and I think that that, that's, that's the reason we make something a video game. And I think that's what really what we're talking about today. We could have used any other example. We could have said, Oh, stranger things. Let's make that a video game. What's it going to be like? Uh, but, but we're, we're talking about this example here. And I think what's meaningful about it is the character himself. What's interesting and compelling about it as an audience is we don't know. Mm-hmm. And because we don't know, um, We want to see the decisions he's making. Okay, so now we're transferring the agency over into the player, and the player becomes the convicted and then acquitted uh, accused murderer. And so that in and of itself becomes very interesting because the things we say have layers. We We can say, I totally didn't kill that guy, and we don't know whether or not, or in this case, girl, we don't know whether or not that's a lie. Or that's the truth, whether he believes it or he's, um, you know, fooling himself. It becomes kind of a, an OJ moment. Mm-hmm. We're like, you know, and it's like, uh, oh, no, I, I totally didn't do it. And we're like, you are so lying right now. And then later he publishes his book, I did it. You know, it's like, wait, what? No, it was, it was, it was, if um, I did it. If I had done it, here's this is how, how yeah. I would have done it. <laughs> you know? Wink, wink. And so that that's kind of what I'm talking about here is if you're not careful as a writer uh, within the context of the video game narrative, you can 
actually just destroy the story that you're trying to tell by giving the option to the player to just completely go, yeah, I'm a cold-blooded killer and I liked it. Mm -hmm. Which works for uh, GTA, does not work. No, it wouldn't work for something like this. this. So you have to be very careful with your decisions. And so, yeah, my my instinct would be to say that either you show them that they're they're innocent, so they can sort of like feel justified in being angry at people, or there's kind of like the interesting twist of we leave it ambiguous, and then as you're receiving this treatment, you're asking yourself, well, do I deserve this treatment? That that's a, that's one of the the moments of dramatic tension in the show. Mm-hmm. One of the, that they keep coming back to is he has that after a while thinking, well, maybe I did do it, and like feeling like, well, if I did, what do I do? Kind of feeling. Mm-hmm. Because there's a there's a term for he that. Actually, he actually doesn't know because he actually did block out a lot of the blood memories of that night mm-hmm. for various reasons. There's like drugs involved and stuff like that. So he doesn't actually know. Mm-hmm. And to be fair, that's actually a common trope in video games where the, the player is the main amnesia. character has yeah, amnesia, amnesia selective amnesia. So we really not wouldn't really be treading new ground <laughs> adding that element to yeah. it. To Deja vu, um, one of my greatest video game uh, memories ever. <laughs> the old NES. Yes, I think there's a term for that. I forget. It's I, I don't think it's Stockholm syndrome, um, but it's basically the idea that you know people essentially, in a sense, abuse you enough that you just kind of come to see their point of view. You just kind of get broken down and kind of like take their side. Well, Stockholm syndrome is whenever you love your captor, so I don't think that's yeah. exactly. But that, that's why I think it's not that. But one could argue that like it has similar elements. That's how I feel about you guys, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I, I think I know. I know what you're talking about, though. That that, that idea of um, eventually you come to believe something that's not even true just because people mm-hmm. tell you that it's true for long enough. Yeah. Um, and so, and, hello, internet. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think there's a there's a lot of different ways to approach this concept. Um, personally, I think I kind of like most the idea of doing it as some sort of like role playing session with live people because I like the the aspect of having living people on the other mm-hmm. end to react um in a free form and natural way mm-hmm. um i think that you would have to find the right people to, to play this game with mm-hmm. because if you if you're playing with people that are not going to take it seriously mm-hmm. then turn it into a big joke oh, yeah, yeah. it would just ruin the entire experience and it's interesting too because even if you're not the one who is the pariah the people playing everyone else um they, they're, they're gonna have to struggle with some things too like they're gonna have to struggle with like okay now in real life, do I do this? Am I prejudiced in this way against people? Do right, I make assumptions right. about people? How do I handle this? Um, and so it's not like they're just like, oh yeah, they've got the easy job. All they have to do is just be like, you know, hateful, spiteful people. It's like, no, that's well, that's and, not and a you pleasant them, thing, right? And you give them <laughs> right. you give them personality cards too. Like you mm-hmm. say, you know, who, what's their relationship to yeah. him? You know, one of them can be like I said, the mother of the the, the daughter that was killed. Mm-hmm. Other one could be oh, one of them could be like um, you know someone else the brother of the daughter or mm-hmm. could be like it's the sheriff in the town or something like this different people or it's mm-hmm. like it's the person that you know used to used to run the coffee shop and is now retired you know it's like mm-hmm. different people that have specific here's what they do in the town and like but also here's kind of their relationship to you yeah or or non-relationship or here's what they think about you to give them a primer mm-hmm. i wouldn't be surprised if something along these lines already exists and if it doesn't it sounds like it might be actually a fun design challenge at some point to come up with a game that would do this mm-hmm. i think the biggest challenge would be like we said before like what is the what's the final you know objective like yeah. how do you how do you get through the game is mm-hmm. it does it have an does it have an end state or is it just everyone goes around and you kind of you know hash it out and try to you know are you are you trying to talk through things with people are you trying to convince people of something yeah. you know if so how does that work it sounds to me too another thing that especially if it's an rpg where um it could go on forever hypothetically you sort of set an in universe uh an in game uh time limit basically so we're going to basically play out a month or a year or a decade or whatever it is however it's scaled um and at the end of this, we're just going to sort of see what happens with it. Mm. Um, if, the, if you don't want to be, the, if you don't want the objective to be something like, say, prove your innocence, yeah, I would think it would. I would want it to be much more self-contained and have it not last anywhere near that long. Oh, I, I mean, it wouldn't. It wouldn't literally be that long. No, I don't. Like, I don't mean literally, but I mean like in universe too. <laughs> playing this game yeah. in real time <laughs> for ten years. Yeah, but I mean like you know a, a year. You know, of like we're gonna play. Th- you know, we played through the quiet year. We're gonna go through a year in the life of this town, and we're gonna see kind of how it reacts to this person who's re-entered. I think that question, "How's this gonna end?" needs to be answered by the TV series first. How's it gonna end? Mm-hmm. Is 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 his innocence gonna be proven? Is his guilt gonna be proven? Is he gonna? I mean, is it gonna end with him going back to prison? I mean, I think that'd be a really interesting way to end the show, personally. And so, if 
because it's a video game, you can have multiple endings, mm -hmm. and often, you know, often should. Sometimes you shouldn't. But I think in this case, it, it seems like maybe you should based on the actions that that are happening. And yeah, so that's yeah. where I'd go with it. I can it. see that. I, you know, I would say that depending on the actions you take over the course of the gameplay, it's going to depend on. Um, whether or not you get back into prison or you kill somebody again or uh, you actually end up getting a job. I mean, maybe maybe that's it. Maybe you play out the year or in this case, this because three seasons here represents three years, right? Or is it is it condensed down? Is much it, less. Uh, much less? Okay. Like, I think the first season was only maybe a week. Oh, okay. So, so in that case, you're you're playing out the first. Oh, let's let's call it three months. Mm -hmm. And over the course of that three months, at the end of it, maybe you actually get that convenience store job, and that's how it ends. Yeah. And that's like a super meaningful thing to you. And I think the value of that is for us as players to recognize the importance of the stuff we have. Like you know, oh wow, you know, I'm I, I'm not. Uh, you know, I've never been accused of anything that I didn't do that was a criminal act. My town doesn't hate me. Mm -hmm. I, I can literally get up today, go get a job, go do what I want. You know, and I sit around and complain because, um, you know, I think I'm too good for a, a convenience store job or something. But but the truth is, you know, there's people out there who they're dying for a convenience store job. Yeah, that's um, true. And I think that, that has, that's where the social value of this type of a game comes in. Um, now, who would make this type of game? I think this could be a really valuable student work. I think this could mm -hmm. be a really valuable indie company's mm -hmm. um, private release to get a name for themselves. I think this is the kind of thing that uh, you do as an independent project and, and get a name for yourself so you can be hired yeah. uh, by you know, that kind of a thing. Um, that's where I see this going. I don't, I don't see yeah, this it, being Rockstar's next it, big hit. It, it, would, it would have to be, <laughs> whoever worked on it, it would have to be a you know, labor of love. It couldn't really be a, this is a corporate project. I'm planning to make money. Right. No. Um, no you, I don't, I don't think, think you would be able to. On something like this, yeah, which in and of itself is kind of interesting because you were saying that, that that this is the first wholly owned property by which network? Well, this is I just said a Sundance was the one who who made this, this right, show. Yeah. I've just never seen Sunday anything on Sundance, and I, I don't. I, I'm not sure if this is their first. Well, Sundance is the original series. It's the independent film, right? Uh, net, you know, network. I, basically, I think this might be their first original series, but I'm, I can't say that for sure. It is actually. It I is. Looked it up. Okay, yeah. looked it up. And that's the point. Is okay. uh, you know that they're indie, yeah. And I think within the, we immediately were taken to an indie space in games too, and I think that's interesting. I'm not going to get into uh, the, what's indie and what's not, yeah, 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 <laughs> because yeah, yeah. because Sundance has a uh, rather dubious reputation now among certain people in um, the film festival. Sure. Scene, well, their in, their intention is to be counterculture and, yes. and a little bit outlier. Yes. And whether or not you curate that or not, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and you say, well, you know, uh, no, let, let's go to the down to the gallery because they've mm -hmm. got this really great uh, show that's going on right now with street art. Wait, what? <laughs> To be fair, that, like that, that also that opinion is coming from people who submit to Sundance and get rejected and think it's because their film is good. But you have to be like influential in order to sort of buy your way into Sundance. And it's like, well, it could just be their film wasn't good. Yeah. <laughs> so who, who knows? But it's a uh, it's a whole other top topic. That is definitely a different topic for a different day. However, um, I, I think that there's if, if we're really following the logic of what we've been talking about here today, I, I think you need to seek the right form for the right story that you're telling. Yes. Um, in other words, if you're going to do an adaptation, a transmedia adaptation in this case, um, there's an intertextuality that comes into play here, which is what type of story are you taking and, you know, and, and putting into this game space? And you've got to recognize that Sling Blade exists. And you've right. got to recognize that if you're not careful, you've just become Sling Blade. Or if you're intentional, you, you're wanting it to, to be sling blade within that context or maybe it's not sling blade maybe it's uh it's something else you know and you can go down that path and you can say oh, okay let's let's go look at all these um different shows about guys who've gotten out of prison you know um because there, there have been two or three that that i've I've seen and I've known, mm -hmm. you know, the, the detective who, I forget the name of it, but there's like the detective who spent 10 years in prison and he's out and, and that kind of a thing. Um, so it's, it's almost, it's almost a sub genre of itself. You know, the, uh, now you're out of prison. What are you going to do? The, thing. We'll, we'll call the genre X-Con maybe. Yeah. The X-Con <laughs> genre, well, genre. Or the reverse of that Cape fear where he actually completely did do it. And he comes out looking for revenge. Right, there you go. <laughs> it's the um, whole movie. Well, and that's, that's, I guess, the question, is because of the nature of the interactivity of video games, do you want that to be within the context of what it could be? 
is even if he was innocent, um, let's say he was totally innocent, but he's so angry about the wasted life that he's become the thing that he was accused of being. Mm -hmm. And so now you're going in and, you know, vigilante style, you know, trying to, to, to kill all the people who put you away. You know, yeah. Is that, is that an option within the game? Or I would not? say, I would say no, but I um, would say no as well. I don't think it fits. Like, I don't think really violence as could be used in certain situations, but very sparing, sparingly. Like mm -hmm. it should be, it should be more of a narrative thrust than a, now you're fighting people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Element. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Um, but I think that there's, some interesting questions that are posed by that. And you could take that to any show and, and adaptation. And we've said before, actually, we've talked about some of the research that's been done on this, but you know, I used to say in my classes that I think that TV shows are a really great uh, model for what video games should be, or maybe the other way around. The video game should follow that narrative model of the ABC story arc of, of various seasons of TV. Uh, and you know, I've, I've had students write about that and, and very successfully uh, present whole essays on, on that very topic, that that model is appropriate to, uh, to, from one to the other. So I think it's a valid question. And I think we could take lots of other TV shows and, and put them into that box and be like, hey, where, what would happen if we took Serenity or Firefly, right, which everybody's been saying for a decade that we need to have a sequel to, and I think we're past that point now but <laughs> yeah but what if instead we made a video game is set in that universe and we, we brought in the voice actors and then because I mean, they did that with ghostbusters remember ghostbusters 3 that that didn't ha exist and, and didn't happen mm -hmm. and then they made the video game about it yeah yeah, yeah. that's true yeah they did they did have what was it called sanctum of slime yeah it was great like and they got yeah. they got Raimi and everybody else in right before they died actually which is yeah, kind of scary yeah. um and and it's just it's a great rounding out of the trilogy to call it a trilogy um you know and, and now it you, you see what happens whenever they make an, an actual new sequel which is then it's you know the media rips it apart well it, it was justifiably ripped apart because paul feig doesn't understand the humor behind the well, original. I, haven't, I haven't seen it yeah. but and i think there are a lot of people who just really wanted to love it as kind of like a statement of i don't like people criticizing it for this reason therefore there, i am determined yeah to like there was a lot it. of that going on too but you it know was, what it was a no-win situation regardless yeah. because it was it was we're going to cast women well you can't do that that breaks the original thing and, and then it's like well you can't say that they exactly can't do that, that, that because then that, yeah and it's just like oh, guys oh goodness i just never saw it because i was never interested no yeah i i, I, I did not pay for it. I'll, I'll wait for it to come to Netflix. I just don't think I'm going to watch but it. I, I've, I also, even, I've never seen the originals. So. Yeah, I, I don't like Paul Feig, so I knew I wasn't going to like it when he was announced as the director anyway. Chris, you need to turn your geek card right now. No, I've been told that before. Yeah. 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 You should see the original, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> final thoughts, then, on uh, this idea of... I think it was interesting to talk through. Uh, I, I will say, again, that I, I think a video game is actually the wrong, me the wrong medium for this. For Rectify? Well, for this kind of story, yeah, I th okay. I really do think the table the tabletop space. The more I think about it, I think that would be much more effective. in because my 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 main, at least for me, what I would want to get across would be that feeling of like, okay, you are you are this you are the social pariah. You are you are isolated. Yet there's people all around you. That kind of feeling mm -hmm. would be what I would want to. Um, I'd, I'd want that player to feel that, and I'd want other people in. in you know, in the game to experience what it's like to have someone in, you know, be that person and how they react to them as opposed to a video game space, which is you versus the system. I, I just, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't think it's intimate enough. I don't know if that's the right word. Right. No, I'm going to use it. That's a good word. I'm going to use it. Um, and I agree with you. I think the tabletop version would be better. But that being said, for people who maybe don't have a big enough circle that's into that sort of game, or if they do, people that really couldn't take it seriously, like you said earlier, that probably ruined the experience. Yeah. I think it could be made into a video game that I think would be niche. But, I mean, I'd play it. I think it would be really interesting. Cool. Um, I think that you could make it work in a video game. It just would be different. Mm. Yeah, I think you could too. What do you think, Doc? I, I very much think so. Uh, you'd have to be very intentional about what it was you were doing. If yeah, you, yeah. You'd be very careful, definitely. Yeah, I mean, like if you're going to go with the noir thing, embrace the noir thing. You know, let mm. there be some humor involved in it, that kind of thing. Um, try to match the tone of the show if that's really what you're going for, or if you're looking for a more kind of a loose thing. You know, do that. I mean, I, 
I, I think the Ghostbusters example is actually really good because um, if you remember the the film's tone, the original film's tone was actually kind of semi serious. Exactly. And then that cartoon came out, and for for years we all we had was the the cartoon, and it was uh, after that cartoon had had a couple of years run that we had a sequel. Ghostbusters mm-hmm. too, and the differences between the cartoon's tone and the other, and, and, and thinking about that is, you know, was it kids media? What do we need to change? Uh, let's pull out the swearing. Let's do these other things. These are the questions you have to make whenever you go from one form to another form, mm-hmm. and these are the same types of questions we're, we're talking about look like at, a video game Look show, at the so. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, series. I right. know it seems odd to bring that up, but Stay with me. No, there's some of those um, iterations which it, are very serious. Well, the comics. The original. The original comics. Kind of dark. Very, very serious. Yeah. And even the first film, the very first film, was actually kind of dark. It was, yeah. There was death and all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But, but, uh, the cartoon series, when that really took off. Yeah, it was corny. It was extremely corny, extremely childish, and that became, those were the Ninja Turtles yeah, the standard. for people for a long time. That's true. And it took a while for them to kind of get back to... A little more, you know, more of the That's darkness true, yeah. element of it, which is still present in, in the um, the IDW comics, the newer iterations now yep. that have come out. And you know, they had a big Kickstarter for the uh, the board game. Yeah. And there's actually been a lot of conflict over that because the board game is supposed to be based on the original comics, and people have been going, "Oh no, no, no! We want to we want to see Casey Jones. Where's Casey Jones?" And it's like, mm, let me well, let me Casey's, explain. Casey's in the original comics. Yeah. I've read them. But that's the thing is is that which one? Because the, the one they're calling for is the one from the newer cartoons, not uh, the original. See, that's yeah, you're right. Very different character, and, right? And the new cartoons are interesting. The new the uh, 3D ones, right? The new I haven't seen those. My um, my nephew loves them, mm-hmm. so I've watched a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> cool, but uh, it's actually surprisingly good. I've enjoyed it, but they changed the characters of both April and Casey. They're drastically different, right? And the the turtles are honestly pretty similar. Splinter's kind of different. Shredder's kind of different. So, like, they do a lot of... They, and I would say it's not... It's definitely not as cheesy as the 80s show. It's really not. Mm-hmm. It's actually much... It's objectively better than the 80s show. But it's also not as mature as, say, the original comics or the current comic series that's out or, like, you know, the series from, like, 2003. And now that I've geeked out over Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles... <laughs> And uh, let's, I think let's, 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 quit, right. let's quit while you're ahead. <laughs> Put I guess. Ahead. <laughs> In case you can't tell, I am a fan. Not, I noticed how I didn't even mention the new the new Michael Bay film. So. Who? Well, now you have. I've never heard of that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining us for episode number 78 of the Backward Compatible.com podcast, our discussion on uh, what if Rectify had a game or a game like Rectify. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm Joe. I'm Doc. And yeah, we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion, because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.